Assistant AG. Um, I'm here representing the defendants. Um, uh, Thank you. Thank you. Um, I reviewed the materials that were filed, including Mr. Cardle. I just received a copy of your materials. I have read them. Uh, this is a motion to see enforcement of the order and judgment. Mr. Hartman. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes, indeed. This is, um, this is a motion to stay this court's order and judgment from last week. Um, it's under the standards provided uh, by the Minnesota Supreme Court most recently in Webster versus Hennepin County. Uh, the main grounds for this are the grounds that the Supreme Court held are the most important factor to consider um, in a case like this. That specifically um, the need to preserve the Court of Appeals jurisdiction by preventing a significant legal issue from becoming moot during appeal. Um, in other words, what's at stake in this motion um, is the existence of uh, appellate jurisdiction over the merits of this case. If um, a stay is not granted, if the, if the um, Secretary is not able to get a stay of this court's decision last week, um, the, this case is going to be moot as soon as the, uh, the data that has been already disclosed is disclosed. Uh, and that witness would prevent the Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court from hearing this case and would, uh, would end this case without any appellate review. Um, the Supreme Court in Webster and the, the prior precedents that the Webster case relies on recognizes that that is an overwhelmingly important um, uh, factor in determining that a stay needs to issue. It's not, however, the only reason why a stay should issue in this case. In addition, um, the legal issues that are presented in this case are very important ones. They apply um, to uh, uh, statewide. They apply to a very large number of people, five and a half million people um, who are either current or former uh, Minnesota registered voters. Because of the former part of that, uh, of that formulation, the people who are affected by this include a whole lot of people who don't even live in Minnesota before, so, and who don't even live in Minnesota anymore. As a result, the effect of um, the final decision in this case will be felt by millions of people um, in quite possibly every state in the union. Um, the, we've cited in our memo uh, several other cases finding that when injunctions affect a large number of non-parties, that supports a stay. Um, and the, um, Murphy, the, the Webster case also determines that the importance of the legal issues um, is, is grounds for a is grounds for a state pending appeal as well. Now, against that, uh, a, a party opposing state needs to make some kind of uh, showing that outweighs it. Uh, I'm not aware of any case in which, uh, when the uh, the existence of appellate jurisdiction was in, was at stake, that a court has ever held that a state should not issue. But in any case, it, it certainly appears that the the exigent circumstances that um, a party opposing this motion would have to show would have to be overwhelming. They would have to be a life or death kind of situation. And it's very difficult to understand how this case could ever um, lead to such a showing. Um, indeed, a case like this, a, a data practice of that case, is the archetypal case, as the Webster case suggests. Um, a data practice is a case, uh, act case, is the archetypal case where a state is necessary because we're dealing with a toothpaste tube kind of situation. If the, the, the data that plaintiffs have sought, and first their DBA request, then their complaint, and the court has ordered disclosed, if that information is disclosed, the toothpaste will be out of the tube. No one will be able to put that toothpaste in the, back in the tube, even if a court were subsequently to rule that, the, that, that data, um, that those data are private data. So at that point, um, as soon as the disclosure has happened, the case would be um, deemed moot and the Court of Appeals or Supreme Court would be forced to dismiss it as moot. Um, that's, that's all I have for the Secretary's case in chief. I'd like to reserve the balance of my time to respond um, to what Mr. Cardall has to present. All right, thank you, sir. Mr. Cardall? Yeah, yes, Your Honor. I've got the benefit of the experience of Minnesota and the data practice cases. And a lot of Minnesota and the data cases, um, the government is fully aware that the value of information goes up and down with time. And so the Secretary of State here is very much aware the Minnesota Voters Alliance would like the information for a few reasons. One, as mentioned, Mr. Ross affidavit, is to begin the analysis required because the policy session in the 2019 state legislature is coming. 
And so we believe that the data is going to show that the scope of, uh, of ineligible people voting in past elections is very, very broad. And we need to have that analysis start with the baseline before the election, because we won't be getting the data after the election until January, February, because that's how they're updated. And so we need to get going because the 2019 legislative session is coming. The Secretary of State's office is aware of this. The Secretary of State office has huge influence on the legislative process. And the Secretary of State's office knows that the voters, the public has this information, uh, that this information has to be used in the policy debate regarding uh, ineligible persons voting and how to stop that. Secondly, um, the Secretary of State's office itself can be evaluated during this, this uh, election year. So if you imagine, uh, one way that the people of Minnesota can evaluate whether the Secretary of State has done, done his job is whether he's allowed a lot of ineligible people to vote. This data can be analyzed before the election, and, and Mr. Simon's performance as Secretary of State can be evaluated. Uh, Secretary of State Simon and, and predecessors have said it's the best election system that we can have there's no voter fraud. I, I don't want to get into voter fraud because that's a criminal aspect. But with respect to ineligible people voting, this has to come to a head. And the way that issues come to a head in Minnesota is the Minnesota Government Data Practices Act because public officials have to share public information. So really, uh, the Secretary of State's memo has missed the point and has not met the burden, not the high burden for stay pending uh, appeal because it's just a focus on this significant legal issue. Well, the legal issue was resolved by the court. The issue is where, where are the relative harms going to lie, and, and where is the public interest, and, and is there going to be irreparable injury? Well, the public needs this information to evaluate the Secretary of State's office of current policies and statutes going into the 2019 legislative session, so the harm would be on the public. Another thing that's concerning is the way the injunction has been drafted for the court's uh, uh, signature doesn't address the discretion issue. The Secretary of State took the position in court that it had discretion to give this to anyone it wanted. And I was carefully looking through the memo and the proposed order, and if the court signs it as it is, then, then it would appear that the Secretary of State would be intending to preserve its, its, his right to give the information to anyone but the Minnesota Voters Alliance. And this uh, causes us great concern because, as in, I mentioned my, my experience in Minnesota Government Data Practices Act cases, as the court could imagine, may have seen, it's the government critics who have the toughest time getting information from the government. And they're the ones that most frequently have to go to the court to get assistance from the court to get the information because they intend to use the information to criticize the public official that gives them the information. So here, if, if the court were to sign a proposed order according to the memo, uh, we're not sure whether the Secretary of State is insisting on the discretion to provide the information to everyone else. Uh, I understand the court's word, the Secretary of State to provide the information to the Minnesota Voters Alliance. And so from the Secretary of State's perspective, I think for this one entity, you're going from May to months. And it's very disturbing that we bring the lawsuit, we get an injunction, and, and, and now, now they want to say, you, you, you don't have to provide it to them, but they want to maintain discretion for everyone else. So ostensibly, your stay would mean they could provide the information to everyone else but us. And, and that, that they haven't worked it out. I mean, how is it that they would want to keep the discretion? Um, well, having to say, no, on the personal information, you know, the government simply doesn't own this information. I mean, the whole point of the government's distinction between public data and government data is the Minnesota Government Data Practices Act, but as the court uh, ruled, certain data is public, is it's the public's information. So if the court were to uphold the order uh, and, and not grant the stay, that would mean the public would have access to this information and it would all be fair. If the court issues a say, then it's unfair because no sort of large alliance won't get it, and then anyone the Secretary of State chooses will get it, according to the Secretary of State's office. And so what private information are we talking about? Because the court already excluded the private data identified in the statutes. 
And, and my concern is, is the very the data that they're referring to as personal information, like felon status, war status, non-citizen status, it's already public information. I mean, the idea of hiding the felon status from us because it's private and personal, well, no, that's already information in the district court system. So our court-appointed uh, guardianships, so the war designation. Non-citizen, that's a Department of Motor Vehicle uh, designation that's also available to the public. So our concern is that they haven't come close to the standard to get a stay uh, pending appeal. Our point is we want the data now so we can uh, use the data to analyze the Secretary of State's performance in office because we believe a lot more knowledgeable people are voting than the Secretary of State has admitted this proceeding. And then secondly, we want the information to prepare for the uh, policy session of the 2019 state legislature. And so I, I think I have to just for a moment, what would the Minnesota Voters Alliance be proposing at the state legislature in 2019 which this data would help? And an example would be, let's leave election data registration the same, but like 47 other states in the USA, let's use uh, provisional ballots because the provisional ballot means everyone gets to vote, even on election day if they register, but then your vote isn't counted until you do the check to see if you're ineligible. And the Secretary of State is on record being opposed to provisional balloting, and our concern is that he doesn't want us to have the information, just like the City Council wouldn't want to have a critic with the information for the City Council meeting, uh, and so he wants to influence that. So this is all about delay, and it's not about uh, preserving the law. I don't even think the court needs to review uh, the legal arguments uh, at, here, but rather just look at, you know, what's the purpose here? If, if in every Minnesota Government Data Practices Act case, the courts were adopt the Secretary of State's argument, and that would mean in every case, all the government would have to do to frustrate a critic for an additional six or nine months is file a motion to stay. And automatically the, the, the uh, stay would be issued by the district court and the, the citizen group or the citizen would be frustrated. So the, the, uh, I believe the Secretary of State's motion falls far short of the mark and, uh, and that the motion is denied. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cardo. Mr. Husband? Um, I, first, the first thing that I would just say is I didn't, I didn't hear Mr. Cardo address the, the, the central legal issue here, which is mootness and the, the threat that it presents to uh, appellate jurisdiction. Uh, and the, the Webster Supreme Court's holding on that point, and exactly the way that the, the Webster ALJ's decision was analyzed by the Minnesota Supreme Court, and made it clear that the most important factor to consider in a situation like this is uh, the importance of preventing a significant legal issue from becoming moot during appeal. That's what's going to happen if the secretary is forced to turn over the, to disclose this data before an appellate court has a, has a crack at addressing the legal, uh, the legal issues in this matter. It, it will become moot and there will be no appellate review. Uh, Mr. Cardell professes to be concerned that there might be some inequitable application of this court's, of this court's determination in this case, that it'll apply in one way to these plaintiffs but a different way to different parties. The best way to address that is to get this to the Minnesota Court of Appeals or the Minnesota Supreme Court so that one, one decision can be issued that applies to um, to every public official who, who holds SVRS data. Um, the, the, the appeals court needs to have access to this case, which means it needs to be prevented from becoming I need you to slow down for the record. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Oh, okay. Um, now, uh, just very quickly, Mr. Cardall referenced a high burden that, that a, a party seeking a, um, a, a stay needs, needs to meet. I'm not aware of legal authority for the notion that uh, that a party seeking a stay under these circumstances has a high burden. Uh, the, uh, I, I'm just not aware of that, um, of that provision of law. Um, but I think another very important issue that Mr. Cardall returned to repeatedly um, was his notion that allowing this case to continue to the Court of Appeals rather than um, just ending all litigation here, which mootness would do, would, would take an enormous amount of time, would push this case beyond the 2018 election and, and would be some kind of serious threat to the plaintiff's interests. Uh, Mr. Mr. Cardall said that allowing an appeal here is going to cost six or nine months. Well, that's entirely up to the appellate courts themselves, and specifically up the Minnesota Supreme Court. If 
if this stay is granted, which is to say, if this case is allowed to go to the to the appellate courts without being rendered moot, Mr. Cardall and the plaintiffs will be in a position where they can ask the Supreme Court to take the case up immediately, basically to to reach down um, and take it so that the, the Court of Appeals doesn't even uh, need to adjudicate it. The Supreme Court can take it directly under Appellate Rule 118. Um, would you oppose that request? I believe I believe we would. On the grounds that we that, that the secretary does not um, does not accept the claims of exigency uh, that that Mr. Cardall um, has provided here, but uh, but if those claims are legitimate, it doesn't really matter whether the secretary thinks that should happen or not. The, the Supreme Court, if that if those claims of exigency are legitimate and are well founded, the Supreme Court will take the case. And the idea that the Supreme Court would take six or nine months. Well, that presupposes that, the, sec that the, the Supreme Court believes that six or nine months is not too much time to spend on this case. I, uh, I represent the Secretary of State in, uh, in appellate courts on a regular basis, very frequently in front of the Supreme Court. I have seen the Supreme Court uh, rule on a case, it was in November of 2016, from the initial filing in the Supreme Court to the final ruling on the merits took less than 28 hours. It was 9.30 on a Monday morning, initial filing, to 1.15 on, uh, on Tuesday afternoon was the final decision on the merits. Now, I don't think this case would be adjudicated that quickly, but the Supreme Court is absolutely capable of adjudicating a case like this in a few weeks or in a month if the Supreme Court is convinced that that's what needs to happen. So there is no zero-sum game here between either we have appellate review of this case or we have a quick determination. Those are not mutually uh, uh, exclusive options here. If this, if this stay is granted, the case goes to the Court of Appeals. The plaintiffs can ask for whatever accelerated proceedings they think are appropriate. If they make a sufficient showing to the appellate courts that those proceedings are necessary, that that acceleration is necessary, they will be given that acceleration and they will be able to get these data within a matter of weeks if that's appropriate on both the facts and the law that the appellate courts address. That's all I have at this point, unless the court has some questions. I do not. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Cardall, anything else? Uh, no, I just was done that. Mootness, uh, we're not clear uh, that the case would be moved because of the uh, constant updating of the information. There are voter, voter registration applications coming in and so forth. And without the Secretary of State identifying harm to others in a specific way, um, I don't think the case is moot because uh, uh, we want the updated information too. So we get one, uh, one uh, copy of the list. And then we continue. Then, then we continue the litigation. While litigation is pending, we get the updates. They win the litigation. They can go back to their position. Uh, the, they win the litigation. They can go back to the appeal. They can go back to their position. That it's only on their discretion to provide information. So there's no harm to the public in sharing this public information or hasn't been identified. So we get the list. Then if they win the appeal, then I guess we stop being able to get the list uh, subject to their discretion. So. I, I don't. I don't see this uh, the same concern. We're talking about uh, the status of voters, whether eligible or eligible, and, and we're, we're talking about the list, including the inactive voters. And uh, we're, we're uh, that's public data. There'll be no harm to the public. It's very similar to information, not all all of it, but uh, to the voter uh, the voter information list. Uh, you know, there's additional information, but we've already discussed that. So I, I don't see the mootness issue. With respect to the significant legal issue, I'm not sure it's so significant. Uh, I'm, you know, having worked on this now for the better part of a year, um, I'm not sure it's, it's like worthy. And so, if the issue is worthy, then that should be cast aside too, because what we basically have is a run-of-the-mill Minnesota government data privacy act claim, where the same arguments have been made by a city or a county, and they won't get to stay. A lot of the Secretary of State can stay based on these arguments. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Anything else? Could I just address the mootness question? Yes. Um, because I confess, I, I don't understand what Mr. Cardall believes mootness means. Uh, in this, this, is, this case is not an ongoing uh, um, uh, demand for continuing updates as to what data the database has on it. It was a specific uh, DPA request for specific, uh, a specific compendium of data that then became a specific lawsuit asking for a specific compendium of data. This court has now issued an order uh, requiring the secretary to turn, or turn over that specific uh, quantity of data. If the secretary um, is, is held to that order this coming Monday, 
and produces that specific quantity of data, that's it. The, 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 the relief that plaintiffs have requested here will have been met, and um, no, no court will have jurisdiction to provide these plaintiffs with anything further. They have gotten what they asked for. Meanwhile, um, the, no court, no entity in the world will have the ability to claw the information back from the plaintiffs if, if subsequently, the, uh, the um, appellate courts uh, end up reversing this court's determination on the law. So in that case, the, the appellate courts will not have jurisdiction to provide the plaintiffs with anything further other than what they've gotten, and they won't be able to provide the, the defendants with anything. That is the definition of mootness. And I, was, I would point out that that comports precisely with the situation in Murphy, where the Data Practices Act was for a large compendium of, of email messages um, in Hennepin County. And Hennepin County uh, first lost litigation in front of an administrative law judge, um, then started to produce the, the email addresses. And then after the first couple of batches of email addresses had gone out, the uh, Hennepin County then sought and received a state pending uh, a state pending appeal. And the ALJ recognized that if all of the email if all of the email messages that had been requested were turned over, if the last batch of email were turned over, that would would lead to a significant issue becoming moot and, and therefore precluding an appeal. Now, Mr. Cardell says somehow this is not moot because the SVRS continually changed. It's true that that database continually changes. But the entire compendium of email, of, of email messages that Hennepin County receives, those continually change too. So if, if that conception of what mootness means were correct, Murphy, uh, sorry, Webster would be decided in the other direction. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cardinal, anything else? Sir? Uh, yes, I mean, uh, Minnesota voters' lines, uh, it, it, that's the position of Secretary of State, would subsequent to the uh, judgment file a request every day. And we believe the Ramsey County District Court uh, holding would be binding on the Secretary of State. Uh, my, my sense here is that there's opposition to that, and I've seen that before in this court. The uh, Ramsey County District Court is a district court, uh, special among the district courts and the principal office of the state agencies within this district. And uh, our position uh, is that the Ramsey County District Court decisions are binding on the uh, Secretary of State, like this one would be binding. And then we subsequently ask for this information you know, pending you know, some sort of state issue to the Court of Appeals or the Court of Appeals decision in favor of the Secretary of State, we would expect to be entitled to that information, and we think that's the covered in scope of the injunction. Thank you. Thank you. And, and can I just say, I, I agree insofar as if, if there's no stay issue, then the, you know, the final determination of the, of the judicial branch on all relevant legal issues in this case is that these plaintiffs are entitled to this information, then a request every day. I mean, on that premise, a request every day would then be responded to you know, on the grounds that yes, the, the plaintiffs are entitled to that. If that is the final determination of the judicial branch, yes. Okay. I will issue a motion shortly. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Court will stand in recess.